Welcome to Chris Cast, Season 1, Episode 48. Title You Can Spin the Same Old Tales to Fresh New Faces and Fresh New Audiences. The Historical Imperative. Come right back after the message. <laughs> Welcome back to Season 1, Episode 48 of Chris Cast. Like I said, you can spin the same old tales to fresh new audiences. Uh, yesterday's episode sort of went into this, and I kind of want to explore it again. Um, I studied African American literary theory and uh, feminist Marxist feminist theory back in 1992 and 93. That was the third wave of feminism, um, including French feminism, Derridian theory, deconstruction, Marxist feminism. That was the first uh, movement towards uh, um, weaponizing feminism and African-American theory and blackness, weaponizing those two theories towards a social justice theory. And I was very proud to be there at uh, GW. Um, But that was the first, that was the first time, you know, that uh, in many cases, um, it had been a long time coming, right? I mean, uh, the 70s and 80s were a time when deconstructionism was being developed in terms of postmodernism, in art, and so forth. And finally, uh, it reached critical theory, and um, uh, in many cases, that that germination of uh, of of Marxist feminist theory has just evolved and evolved and evolved and become political, and become part of the modern uh, dialectic, become mar- part of the modern narrative, and has become the baseline for education, at least uh, high end. Uh, education throughout the United States, if not the planet. I mean, Helen Sixu and Jacques Derrida, um, I don't know if they knew what their influence was going to be. They were responding to to modernism. They're responding to the uh, figurative. They were responding to the to the um, to the male gaze. Uh, cisgender male gaze and it's very interesting to see now that we we you know they say the fourth wave of feminism started in 2012 but you know there's just you can spin the same old tales that have happened before you can spin them to new audiences this is something that um, is very familiar and should be very familiar, but isn't to the environmental muse, uh, movement, to the uh, to the labor movement, to the <clears throat> civil rights movement, to the um, even the Native American movement, uh, women's movement. I mean, just in my fifty years, uh, I've seen uh, an environmental movement in the seventies. I've seen an environmental movement in the 80s. I remember, you know, Al Gore acting like he invented um, global warming. I remember Frank Luntz repackaging it as uh, climate change. This is not a new issue. This is not... I remember um, Jimmy Carter making the drastic move of you know, raising um, gas prices, uh, increasing requirements for uh, for mileage and for uh, and and for changing 
what cars and car companies could and couldn't do in terms of the types of cars they would and wouldn't enter into the marketplace with regards to uh, gas guzzler taxes and so on and so forth and how uh, being told uh, about um, eco-terrorism that happened in the 60s and 70s. Hey, Google, when did eco-terrorism happen in America? 1980s. On the website thoughtco.com, they say, ecotourism itself did not become prevalent as a travel concept until the late 1980s. Wow. Well, I thought they were, I thought they were earlier. But yeah, late 1980s, that was, uh, there were a lot of um, anti-nuke um, environmentalism, anti-nuclear energy, anti-nuclear bomb, um, uh, extreme environmentalists, um, let me see. Hey Google, what was the manifesto of the, of the weather underground? According to Wikipedia, beginning in 1974, the organization's express political goal was to create a revolutionary party to overthrow American imperialism. The FBI described the WUO as a domestic terrorist group, with revolutionary positions characterized by black power and opposition to the Vietnam War. So the eco-terrorism that I thought of had more to do with, uh, with anti-imperialism, anti-capitalism, activism, activism, happen, uh, activism happening in the mid-1970s in, uh, in response to the civil rights movement, in response to the, to the Vietnam War. That's awesome. I was four years old when that happened. Um, I know that my mom in 1969... Uh, 1970 before i was born but with me in her belly i know that she as a manhattanite used to protest the war my little socialist marxist mama so um this is an amazing pendulum it's a backwards and forwards movement i remember uh that you know the 1980s there was the uh, entire capitalist movement it was you know greed is good it was uh gordon gecko times it was ronald reagan uh and that was a an aggressive response to the uh what was perceived as the self-indulgent uh libertine hey google volume up hey google define define libertine on the website dictionary.com, they say, free of moral, especially sexual, restraint, dissolute, licentious, free thinking in religious matters, archaic, unrestrained, uncontrolled. Hey, Google, volume up. Hey, Google, volume up. So I think the 1970s were definitely perceived as a, um, I mean, the 1970s were the disco era and it was a very libertine type of time. This was pre-AIDS. Um, it was, uh, there was a lot of benefit from the struggles that happened in the 1960s with regards to free love. And don't forget, there were the beatniks of the 50s. Uh, there were the beat poets of the fifties that this is a very much a, a continuum that happened as a result of a post-war America. Um, there are just many waves and ebbs and flows that have happened in America and it always seems to correct itself. And by correction, I'm not playing on either side. Like I, I love, uh, I would love an America that had a, a fairness to the least, uh, the least love supported and the people who are least able to, to take care of themselves. I, I believe in, I believe that, uh, it's a misnomer to call free college or free medicine or free healthcare free, right? In the same way that you don't, you might get free 
champagne and free, uh, you know, freaking lunch and dinner and so forth <clears throat> at, uh, you know, in, 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 uh, in first class of, of an airplane, but that's because you're on the airplane. In many cases, you know, America is a, is a country and the civilians and the citizens of that country should have at least, at least the benefits of membership. And I think that the ROI, the value of membership should be government supported, right? I believe that when you are a citizen, no matter what your ability to contribute, um, you should be able to get uh, at a baseline those things that would allow you to make the civilization more successful. Um, the worst thing that ever happened to America is for America to become uh, someone else's market. And another thing that is, uh, is terrible about America is that uh, America milks itself, right? America is both the, uh, the ant and the aphid. In many cases, we're almost a closed biosphere, a closed terrarium where we um, produce and consume in the same country. Other countries like Germany and Japan and uh, China, um, they don't depend on their citizens uh, 100% to be the generators of profit, to be the generators of the same dollars that feed the country um, uh, in, a, in a biosphere, if you will, um, but in America, in many cases, we eat our own poop. And I don't think that's sustainable, and I don't think that's fair. And it's really easy when you, when the predator and the prey live in a, in a system like this, it's really easy to, to blame the prey as opposed to blaming the predator, right? Uh, you blame the impoverished for being poor. Um, and, you know, you... you uh, you worship the apex predator when, in fact, it's not a competition. the The prey could never be a predator. It's not a choice. Um, and in many cases, the the runt, even the runt of the predator, has it better off um, than even the most uh, hardy of the of the prey. So. Anyway, so back to you can spin the same old tales to fresh new audiences. I mean, you can see this, like I said in yesterday's podcast, you can see this every day, and we'll talk about that in a second. I don't know what this one is about. I think that this one, I think I made way too many notes, and I think that messed up everything because I spent all of my, all of my uh, curiosity on the research and didn't bring it to the podcast, but We'll come back and see if I can bring it back together in the next segment. Oh, thank you. Hey there, Chris Abraham here, Chris Cast, Season 1, Episode 48. It's incredibly rainy here, but it will be in the 60s, so it'll be warm-ish. And I will be getting out of the apartment, but it is quiet and lovely in here now. So I will do this and continue this. So I, I, I say this to everybody, right? You don't... And, and I keep on forgetting because I'm a literature guy, right? And people who are into literature tend to have read all of the great works, right? People who are into film uh, have the audacity of reading and watching and consuming uh, all the best that film has had to offer, all the way back to, um, to silent movies, 
you know, like Nosferatu and all the way back to, to films uh, at, at the beginning of the, of the art. And people who are interested in history tend to have historical imperatives. But, and musicologists will go all the way back to primitive forms of, of music and go through the Middle Ages and, and explore uh, the, the great, the great uh, golden age of classical music and move on to jazz and big band and 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 pop music and then rock and EDM and all that other kind of fun stuff. But someone who's just a a a, a consumer who goes to the cinema and to watch a movie or picks up a novel to read or um, turns on the radio does not have the um, the historical perspective that you and I have, or even the benefit of age, right? I mean, I benefited from my mom loving the movies that my grandparents loved, loving the movies she loved, and then having her actively share the movies that she and her grandparents loved, as well as the movies and so forth. But I think kids nowadays, right, they're very much uh, au courant. And you can sell them an old story, uh, an old movie, uh, even the same movie, as we see Disney has, has cracked the code and has realized that, um, that the same movie, even though it is the best movie, right? Like, I don't know when they're going to redo The Professional. I don't know when they're going to redo, uh, you know, Rambo or anything else like this, but when they do, uh, they're going to, or, or whatever movie, they're going to do it. Um, they're not going to do it. They're going to do it so it rhymes. Uh, they're going to do it with an attempt to try to appeal to, uh, to a modern audience. I mean, you could see that with Red Dawn. I mean, I love the movie. Hey, Google, when was the movie, the original movie Red Dawn made? August 10th, 1984. On the website mentalfloss.com, they say, on August 10th, 1984, Red Dawn stormed into theaters. The Cold War era film envisioned a WWII-like scenario of what it would look like if communist Soviets and Cubans invaded a small Colorado town, and what might happen if a group of teenagers fought back with heavy artillery. Hey Google, what is the, when was uh, the second Red Dawn made? In the United States of America, it came out on August 10th, 1980. Hey Google, when was the remade, remake of Red Dawn? According to Wikipedia, Red Dawn is a 2012 American action film directed by Dan Bradley. The screenplay by Carl Ellsworth and Jeremy Parsmere is a remake of the 1984 film of the same name. God, those things. Time passes like a mofo. Uh, and this is going to continue happening. Because, you know, I, I know from my uh, friends who are dads that, that um, you know, a lot of, uh, like, only nerds listen to the Beatles. Uh, the only reason anybody's listening to music from the 80s is because it's fashionable now. Uh, because people my age are making the films and they're including nostalgic music in their films because they can. In the same way that when I was watching movies um, at you know, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 in TV shows like The Wonder Years, uh, all those, all that music was from uh, the 60s and 70s, and all the movies we were watching were made by people who were being nostalgic about the 50s. Um, and so the same thing happens with, uh, with, with, with modern activism. I mean, the, uh, let's look at the, look at my notes a little bit. Environmentalism, Mike, there was the, there was the, uh, conservation movement. Um, the modern day environmental movement in the United States began in the sixties and seventies. The movement was originally focused on a few prominent environmental issues and disasters. In the sixties, the pollution of the Great Lakes became a rallying point for environmentalism in the United States. Um, 
the first conser- conservation groups uh, were the, like, for example, the National Audubon Society, which was founded in uh, 1886, and the Boone and Crockett Club in 1887, the Sierra Club in 1892, Save the Redwoods League in 1918, 1935 in the Wilderness Society, 1946 in the Ecologists' Union, 1961 the World Wildlife Fund, uh, and then the in 1948 in the post-war period, uh, the for, first piece of legislation to lay down federal regulations of water quality, the Federal Water Pollution Control Act, is passed by Congress. This act, known as the FWPCA, will go through amendments in 56, 65, and 72 to broaden the government's authority in water pollution control. And then, um, for example, in 1948 in uh, Donora, Pennsylvania, 20 people die and over 600 people go to the hospital after sulfur dioxide emissions from a nearby steel and wire plant descend in the form of smog made worse by a temperature inversion that trapped the sulfuric poison in the valley of the town. The incident will lead to the first U.S. conference on air pollution in 1950, uh, sponsored by the Public Health Service. Um, all of these things, you know, I mean, now we're focused on global warming, we're focused on existential threats and so forth, but there have been, there's a rich tradition of experience that can be gleaned from from historical uh, experiences and from the um, political back and forth between uh, free market and conservation, from people who believe that the market will control and and the the successes and failures as a result. I dare say that the 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 strategy right now is a an incredibly aggressive hearts and minds uh campaign that realizes that the free market isn't going anywhere anytime soon so it is essential that the heart of man is is changed and that the heart of man actively engages the free market in such a way that the free market needs to respond to these requests with something appropriate to the priorities and needs. Unfortunately, I just watched a car reviewer, Doug DeMuro, review the new uh, Ram uh, four-door off-road pickup truck named the TRX or the T-Rex. And that um, car has a uh, an average city uh, mileage of eight miles per gallon with uh, a rate of 10 miles per gallon city and 14 miles per gallon the highway. So I would say that only the the eternal 20% only cares about anything. And they're the ones that are constantly, uh, they're the same 20%, they're the same nerds of, in high school that have been, that, that have pushed everything through, right? But 20% is a lot of people and 20% can definitely scare um, or lead a population into making strong differences. Um, unfortunately, the there has been a what does that say? They they called it a an inversion. Hey Google, what is a temperature inversion? According to Wikipedia, in meteorology, an inversion, also known as a temperature inversion, is a deviation from the normal change of an atmospheric property with altitude. It almost always refers to an inversion of the thermal lapse rate. Normally, air temperature decreases with an increase in altitude. I personally believe that ready access to uh, mobile phones, to social media, to... um, to text messages, to to chat platforms and everything like that has created a social inversion that has allowed the silent 80% to at least um, uh, wag the dog, if you will. And in many cases, um, there doesn't need to be a government-run McCarthyism. 
in order to correct what are perceived as anti-American values. And let me define anti-American values, even though these are values that are built into, into our last uh, 200 years. Anti-American values are perceived as socialism, Marxism, uh, unionism, all these things that were, were ripe and rampant uh, in the 20s and 30s are now, um, or were until uh, maybe five years ago, um, the kind of thing that would get you on a list. And um, now, since, uh, come on everybody, Obama was not a Marxist or a socialist or even a good liberal. I mean, yikes. He, he, the ADA, um, I mean, sorry, the, uh, uh, the Obamacare um, is not a social program um, in any way. Uh, and there's not even a competitive sin, sin, uh, there's not even competition in the marketplace. There's not interstate competition. There's not, it's the, uh, the healthcare system and the insurance system is not even, not even properly. It's, it's monopolistic. It's not capitalistic. It's certainly not free market, but we did have Jimmy Carter and that didn't work out well. It seems like whenever we get a Jimmy Carter, then we get a, um, we get a, uh, a Ronald Reagan right after him. And whenever we get a, a, uh, Barack Obama, we're always going to get a Donald Trump right after him. So that's another example of, you can spin the same old tales to a fresh new audience. Um, wow. This is really just the ramblings of an old man. I just, you know, I want you to kind of look into history and to see that, you know, right now feminism is in its fourth wave, that the only time that uh, black Americans, African Americans have fought in this country is not simply over the last 10 to 20 years and then back in the 60s. There have been any number of times um, between when the end of, you know, during, uh, after abolition and when, uh, and when blacks have fought for their rights. I re remember, uh, world war one happened, world war two happened. Um, the civil war happened. There were fights over integration of, of, uh, inter of integration of service people. Um, in fact, it's really crazy to see I like to joke and say that uh, the U.S. Armed Forces are a bunch of commie bastards who live in, who who are a bunch of comrades who live in uh, in communion with each other. Um, but my f military friends hate when I say that. When I say that, uh, of course, America can have socialism, Marxism, and communism. Look at the uh, look at the uh, Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marines. But considering that their job is to fight damn commies, I dare say that they hate hearing that. But, you know, it's because they recognize it in the mirror. Um, and I guess really, I think I handled this particular podcast wrong because I think that I meant one thing by the title and I'm telling you a different thing, which is to say that um, that everything that's hot right now has been hot before and everything that has been hot before has cooled down and you need to prepare for that. Um, and that, uh, all of these things are cyclic and you have to do what a lot of these, uh, nonprofits have done, which is go for the long term. I mean, all these organizations that I mentioned are still, uh, active to this day. Um, there's a lot you can learn from them. But I will try to tell you what I was trying to tell you in the first place after the break.
Welcome back. Episode 48, Season 1, Chris Cass. My name's Chris Abraham. What you, you can spin the same old tales to fresh new audiences. Like I said, um, or like I didn't say, and what I should probably say in the next podcast is that um, humans work on narrative. Narrative is storytelling. Stories that you believe to be true. Stories that you believe to do, be true about your life, right? Believe it or not, climate change was a re a renaming that was done by Frank Luntz uh, during the Bush administration as a way of taking a lot of the heat out of the concept of global warming. Uh, climate change, by its very nature, uh, has less impact than global warming. Um, global warming has an emotional, um, has a, has a real strong feeling, whereas climate change just sort of gives the onus of the change back to the natural world. The, these narratives have been, um, these stories have been told over and over again, and these stories have been told and untold. They've been built and collapsed. They've been uh, constructed and deconstructed over and over again using the same strategies, using the same narratives, using the same arguments, uh, using the same tools. And that's why, uh, hey, Google, who who is the quote from, you cannot dismantle your master's house with your master's tools? Lords. According to Wikipedia, the criticism was not one-sided. Many white feminists were angered by Lord's brand of feminism. In her 1984 essay, The Master's Tools Will Never Dismantle the Master's House, Lord attacked underlying racism within feminism, describing it as unrecognized dependence on the patriarchy. Audrey Lord, God bless her. Hey Google, what books did Audrey uh, Lord write? Audrey Lord is the author of 40 books. Here are the first three, Sister Outsider, Zami, A New Spelling of My Name, and The Cancer Journals. Hey Google, what is Audrey Lord's most popular book? Books frequently mentioned on the web include Sister Outsider, The Collected Poems of Audrey Lord, Zami, A New Spelling of My Name, and others. Hey, Google, what is uh, Audre Lorde's most important essay? Sorry, I don't know how to help with that. Here are other things you can try. Alexa, what is Audre Lorde known for? According to Wikipedia, Audre Lorde was an American writer, feminist, womanist, librarian, and civil rights activist. She was a self-described Black lesbian, mother, warrior, poet, who dedicated both her life and her creative talent to confronting and addressing injustices of racism, sexism, classism, heterosexism, and homophobia. So in other words, the woman is a saint. <clears throat> God bless Audrey Lord. Here's something I found on the web. According to BrainQuote.com, the Latter-day Saint woman who follows Christ is... Alexa, stop. So Audre Lorde is someone you should definitely get to know. Um, it's She's important because her theory that you cannot deconstruct or you cannot, uh, you cannot, you cannot dismantle the master's homes with the master's tools. It's very important to remember because um, all the energy that went into um, the um, Black Lives Matter movement, all the energy that went into the uh, resist movement, all the energy that went into Greta. Um, whatever her name is. All the energy that went into uh, the pussy hats. All the energy that went into um, the uh, anti-sexual abuse um, activism. All these things have been co-opted before all of these things have been 
minimized before. All of these things have been corrupted before. All of these things have been d destroyed. Um, but even worse, the narratives have been taken over by um, the master, by the patriarchy, by the powers that be. And it's very important to not allow these actual um, emergent movements, these actual sui generis movements, these actual people movements to be co-opted by, um, by rich industrialists or, um, if you will, many, many, many times corporatists have, have, bought, um, have bought up companies just in order to shut them down because they don't like uh, the competition, they don't like the uh, distraction. And I think again and again and again, other organizations co-opt other organizations, taking their steam and doing a, um, a judo uh, redirect into, into their organizations. For example, uh, Black Lives Matter uh, organization is and has been co-opt by um, by the workers movement and by, um, uh, Marxism and socialism by the, by the workers party. I mean, these are, these are important things, right? But, um, the, they aren't necessarily, uh, they aren't necessarily helpful and they bring attention away from the core interests, right? So, um, and they can also be very easily and very quickly uh, diluted so that they become less and less and less, if you will, uh, extremist and more and more and more. Uh, I want, you know, more and more many colors of Benetton or more and more a, a signifier that is just a become a trope uh, on an Instagram um, selfie. Right, something that becomes infantilized, or becomes commodified, or becomes trendy or fashionable in the worst way, insofar that trendy or fashionable things are in trendy or fashionable forever. Uh, people are fickle. Movements are fickle. Things transform. There's a lot of things you can learn from the old tales. You can learn from the old tales, and you can see how how the old tales are being told to fresh new audiences. And you can maybe uh, develop and produce ballworks against that. Ballworks, ballwork, ball ballworks. Uh, to prevent that, you can maybe uh, find ways of disallowing. Audre Lorde's patriarch, or white woman, or cisgender man, or capitalist, or conservative, you can prevent, you can proactively prevent the demonization, or the dismiss, you know, I mean, if you are, I mean, for example, the thing that's used over and over again is George Soros, or or, or before George Soros, it was someone else. Before someone else, it was, it was, um, it was, this was all the Russians, or this is all the Chinese, or, I mean, the fact that all y'all believe that the Russians were manipulating Trump at all is really just amusing to me, because that's an old tale being used for new audiences, right? Um, this is an old completely an old chestnut of the spooky, spooky uh, Soviet communists are, are influencing um, this and that in America and the McCarthyism and all these other kinds of things that, that all y'all are like falling for again and again. And, and if, you, if you're aware of it, if you realize, well, um, we're in a complete inversion with regards to the Russians. Most people don't know that Russia isn't a communist society. Um, the only interest Russia has in terms of, of doing any type of interventionism is uh, sh shoving it to us. They don't want us. They just don't like the fact that we constantly put um, trade pressure on them. 
<clears throat> and that um, we're kind of dicks to them in spite of the fact that they really haven't done anything terrible, um, not in 20 years. And um, not only are the Russians extremely proud people, but there are a lot of really rich Russians that have a um, sphere of influence. And the, 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 most, the richest and most prideful uh, hubristic uh, man in the entire earth, besides maybe... Um, Donald Trump, who is actually just a paper tiger, is actually a real lion named by the name of Vladimir Putin. You know, and not only that, but hey, Google, how tall is Vladimir Putin? Sorry, I don't know how to help with that. Hey, Google, how Here. old is Vladimir? How how tall is Vladimir Putin? Vladimir Putin is sixty-eight years old. Hey, Google, how tall is Putin? Sorry, I don't know how to help with that. Here are wow. You can try. He has so much control that he took his height off of the internet. Let's see. He's exceedingly short. How tall is Vladimir Putin? Vladimir Putin is 170 centimeters tall. Hey Google, how many feet is 170 centimeters? 170 centimeters is 5 feet 6.929 inches. To convert from centimeters to feet, divide unit of length by 30.48. I I think uh hey Google how tall how many feet is 160 centimeters Hey Google how many feet is 160 centimeters 160 centimeters is equal to 5 feet 2.992 inches Yeah That's exactly right he's 5 foot 2 um there's a picture of him standing next to Angela Merkel, and she's 165 centimeters, um, and he wears platform shoes. So he's around 160 centimeters tall, which means Vladimir Putin is only five foot two, um, and that's why uh, nobody wants to talk about it. Anyway, that is an aside. But since I use this to get to know things about myself, it's really funny to know that. Um, but yeah, be careful about how your how your uh, how your activism is being is being steered. Also, care about how it's being funded and by whom. Follow the money, um, and realize that, uh, as I said in the beginning, say now and say forever forward. You can spin the same old tales to fresh new audiences. So. Historical imperatives are really good, uh, and they always work because human nature is beautiful in that everybody thinks that uh, they can't get fooled like the past, but everybody is always fooled by the same things that people in the past were fooled by. The Bible, uh, scholars of the Bible really know that, right? We're the same people, the same exact humans fall for the same exact stuff as we were 50,000 years ago. Every new generation, which is only a separation of 20 or 30 years, believes that they're more sophisticated, that they're more savvy, um, and that they're less likely to fall or be duped or fooled than the generation before them. <clears throat> and that is hubris. That is stupid. That is patently untrue. And I would probably predict that a lot of the uh, amazing form of momentum that was perpetuated and instigated by the last 18 months of activism is going to be co-opted, um, uh, diluted, and, um, and relegated to, uh, to caricatures 
and um, it's gonna like every like everything else. The hippies were eventually just dismissed as being naive. Every group is dismissed as being naive. Um, in fact, the groups behind the previous generation consider the new groups to be naive. Um, being dismissed as naive or or uh, suffering from the hubris and and the the confidence of youth and all these other things have been used uh, generation after generation after generation. They were used against against the cult of Jesus as he was growing his um, his religion uh, by the by the you know the Pharisees and the and the oh I learned a new. I learned a new uh, a new group, uh, the Suckabees. No, um, let me. Uh, I'll be right back. Uh, the Sadducees, uh, according to the Christian Acts of the Apostles, the Sadducees did not believe in resurrection, whereas the Pharisees did. In Acts, Paul chose this point of division to gain the protection of the Pharisees. The Sadducees also rejected the notion of spirits or angels, whereas the Pharisees acknowledged them. Anyway, that's just something I learned. So, anyway, I don't know. I think I'm out of juice. Um, let me look at my notes. Uh, we'll be right back. That was crazy, guys. My name's Chris Abraham. This is episode 48, season one, Chris Cast. You can reach me at chrisabraham.com, at chrisabraham on Twitter, at chrisabraham on Instagram, uh, youtube.com slash chrisabraham, facebook.com slash chrisabraham. You can email me at chris at abraham.su. You can leave your hat on. You can text me at plus one two oh two three five two five zero five one. You can also call me at two oh two three five two five zero five one. But if we don't have a date, then we're not going to I'm not gonna answer the call. Um what else? Uh um emailing me works. Um I'm at linkedin.com slash in slash Chris Abraham. I am, um, I'm Chris Abraham on Instagram. Oh, uh, go to wherever you go to, wherever you listen to your podcast and be sure to like subscribe review. Um, and then maybe go to Stitcher or iHeartRadio or, 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 uh, Spotify or um, Anchor.fm or even Google Podcasts or Apple Podcasts and especially there and write a review, uh, write some comments, um, give me 12 stars, um, feel free to call me a loco moco. And um, on that note, you can even go to Anchor.fm slash Chris Abraham abraham slash support and support me or you can even um i don't know you can continue listening that would be enough for me i don't know i think maybe i'm doing these podcasts for me instead of you uh anyway talk to you soon i'll get back to you on episode 49 and have a nice day